Mark's language. And so with that, uh, Jose, I will pass it over to you um, and I will be here to help get people onboarded to the environment that uh, we were talking about. And uh, if there's any questions behind the scenes, I would ask everybody to use Zoom today for the communication, which we'll prim uh, primarily use uh, if you have any issues. Um, if you're having any troubles at all, uh, you, you can also send me private messages on Zoom um, and I can help communicate with you one by one. So either way works fine. And with that, I will go ahead and turn off my screen share and pass things over to our instructor. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen also real quick. Uh, thanks, uh, Phil, thanks for the organizing committee of the Iron Pharma. It's a great honor uh, to be here. So first of all, uh, let me just uh, introduce myself. So this is my personal website, everything that I do, uh, all the links to GitHub repos, um, email address and everything, and, and a lot of uh, open access content, Creative Commons contents that I have, they are in those links here. And I, I have experience with, with R, Julia, and Python. Um, I'm also a certified RStudio Tidyverse instructor, so I'll be doing a lot of analogies in this workshop uh, from people coming from R, which I think is a common background here. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat or open your mics. You are free to express yourselves, whatever you want. Just uh, mind you to adhere to the code of conduct of our uh, R in Pharma uh, conference. And also, I'm a director of training and education at Pumas.ai. Those folks who doesn't know Pumas.ai, it's a nice tool for you to do pharmacometrics and any sort of pharma-related workflow, PKPD modeling, MCA in Julia. And we are launching at ACOP our new product called DeepUmas, where we are doing scientific modeling, which is machine learning applied to differential equation modeling, PKPD modeling. And we are launching this. So if, if anyone is interested and if you are going to ACOP, visit us at our booth. And this is uh, our product. And please uh, check pumas.ai and anything, send a, a, an email to sales at pumas.ai. So with that, uh, let's uh, go to the uh, to the other window to our, uh, I think it's this one. Yes. Yep. So, Still uh, loading. today's uh, workshop is going to be based on this GitHub repo, which I'm going to, to, to paste it here. Uh, we also have a live uh server that you can you can you can uh, use it now for for the workshop to follow along if, if you want to uh do we have the the updated uh link to the to our live uh where we're going to use uh for today we've got julia installed on the back end and it should be available for you through here um, hopefully, if you've got to this point, now I'm going to pass things back over to Jose, and he's going to help you get up and running with Julia inside of the RCDO uh, workbench environment, if that's what you'd like to use today. So you can use the local installation, um, or you can also um, use this today. Just keep in mind, this will stay up for about 24 hours. Okay. So I guess I'm sharing the right screen. So you're seeing my Visual Studio Code. Let me just zoom in a little bit here. Uh, so there you go. Uh, the first thing that we do is we go to the Explorer tab on the left here, and you see that we cannot see any folder. So the first thing that we'll do is open a folder, and you see a nice tooltip will pop up and with a drop-down menu, and we go to the last option, which is class dash repo. And you select that, and then you hit OK after you select that. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So open folder, class repo, and then hit OK. Once you do that, it's going to refresh your, your browser window. And then you'll be inside our repository in a fully uh, available, fully functional uh, 
environment for you to run Julia code and for you to try it out and for us to start with this introduction. So first, there is a pop-up saying that, oh, do you, do, you trust, do you trust the authors in, of the files in this folder? You, you can say uh, trust the authors, yes, and then you are all set. In the left on your file explorer, so let me zoom in a, a little bit, you should have a, uh, yes, and okay. So you should have um, all of the files that we are going to be using today. And if you if you take a look at our GitHub repo, I'm going to put this link again for those who join us a little bit late. So this is the repo that we are going to use. And if you take a look, it's the same repo that I that uh, in GitHub is the same one that is already cloned and pre-configured and and prepared for you in this uh, nice uh, environment here. So I think everyone was able to to get so far here. Uh, let me know if you are having issues in the chat or open your mics. Feel free to to express yourself. Uh, one one more thing that that people ask in the chat is: we are recording this session, and this session will be available at the R in Pharma YouTube channel uh, briefly soon. So uh, for those who need to drop out or uh, are missing this this webinar? You this workshop? You have the recording available. So of course, we're going to lose all the, of the interactivity. Uh, see if you can find the folder class repo. Yes. Uh, so let me let me do it again. So this is like a fresh session when you when you open your. Oh, it's already open for me. Okay. So yeah, I think uh, for... you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think for the students, it opens up to Julia, and the class repo is collapsed um, or it, it's closed. So you just need to collapse or open up the class repo uh, arrow. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's the YouTube channel. Uh, so it's the... there you go. Uh, so let's. First of all, um, start with a zero zero Y Julia. So this is a this is a, a Markdown file. It has uh, some personal opinions of mine. So this is not I don't know why this is not rendering. Uh, why the preview is not working? So okay, let's let's show like this then. Um, so why should we use Julia? Uh, I teach R, Python, and Julia, and I work with R, Python, and Julia in my in my day to day basis, mostly Julia now. Uh, so this is my opinion. This is not R in Pharma's opinion or anyone else's opinion. Uh, I think that Julia is the best language for scientific computing. Anything that that needs like big data, uh, any sort of intense tasks like machine learning, deep learning, auto diff, Bayesian modeling, uh, PKPD. I think that, that Julia is, is suited to this task. It's very fast. It is very, very fast. Uh, you, will, you will probably have, may have already crossed some uh, resources that, that told you that uh, if you need to run R fast, you need to do, do it with RCPP or maybe you are a daredevil and you want to go the whole sports run uh, way, um, you can do that. But those are what I call slow productivity, slow prototyping languages. They are fast, but they are hard and they are error prone. And they are slow for you to prototype and for you to produce something useful. They are very fast. They are very powerful, but they are slow for you to have something quite easy to do and quick and dirty. So, so Julia fills in this void. This is what we know as the two language problem. So a lot of researchers and, and industry uh, programmers and analysts, they develop an algorithm or an, an analysis using a language that is easy, but slow, like R, Python, or maybe uh, MATLAB. 
And then when the, the, the thing goes into, in, into production, the solution goes into production or you need to publish it or you need to commercialize it, you then transpile your code, convert your, your, your slow but easy code to read into a fast but hard code to read and to, and to produce. So this is uh, what we call the true language problem. Uh, Julia has a friendly syntax. It's, it's uh, very similar to Python and a, a little bit with R. Uh, it's very easy to install, Julia. So I teach a lot of courses use, using uh, R, Python, and, and Julia. And Julia is by far the, the most easiest language to, to install. You, you just go to juliaLang.org. Download, you download the binary for your system, and that's it. You are all set to go. Uh, sometimes I give like like uh, workshops where I need to, I spend like one uh, full class uh, helping students to get their C++ two chain installed. So this is one nice thing for you to, to, to get into Julia. It's very easy to install. Uh, you, you have full support for Unicode and Latex uh, characters. So you don't need, I'm a statistician, so you don't need to do alpha and beta. You can say, you, you, you can say hello to alpha and beta the same way as you read them in the, in the textbook. And it's very easy to add and prototype new algorithms or, or new um, solutions. And it's fast straight from, from, from the gun. And we have a, a hand raised. Yes, go ahead, Kartik, or maybe wrong. Yeah, uh, okay. I have a question. Uh, do yeah. you mind? Sure. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, uh, I've heard this many times that Julia is faster than C, C++ and all, but under the hood, where, where, where does this, what's responsible for the speed up or like, uh, what's essentially where Julia stands out as compared to C or C++? So let me just address the last point, then, I'm, then I will go to your question. And the last point is that, uh, Julia, for you to manage projects like dependencies and package versions is very easy. You can have uh, reproducible environments, bake it straight into your standard library. So every Julia install has a nice package manager and project management for reproducible uh, environments. Uh, that is not so easy to do in Python, and it's very difficult to do in R. It's it's definitely achievable, but but Julia is makes this very easy. So, uh, replying the, the 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 question about why Julia is fast, there is a kind of a very in depth. Uh, heavy technical introduction. If you go to my content, you go into Bayesian statistics using Julia, and you go here in the Y Julia. So here you have a bunch of Julia code, Python code, R code, C++ code. And this is like, if you want to know the, go, go down into the nuts and bolts, Y Julia is fast. I, I recommend this content here. But if I will summarize in a few sentences, um, so every interpreted language before Julia or the major ones that, that, that work successful before Julia, like Python and R, they uh, convert the code into either Fortran code or another low level language code like C in the case of Python, everything gets, gets compiled to C Python using the C Python interpreter. There is a lot of, uh, a lot of overhead in that conversion with the Python global interpreter lock, the GIL, and also the a lot of garbage collection. So what Julia does is if you if you if you go to llvm.org, there is uh, llvm is the compiler between. Uh, it's a big project with a lot of backing from Apple, Google, and 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 several other companies. And they have an uh, intermediate representation language. That's what we call LLVM IR. And what Julia does is it converts all of the, your Julia code into this intermediate re, uh, representation for LLVM. And then it says to LLVM compiler, OK, this is, this is your language. 
optimize this. And then the LLVM compiler can optimize all of that translated code. So this makes Julia uh, not an interpreter language, not a static language, but a just-in-time compile language, a JIT compile language. So it, it uh, generates LL, LLVM uh, code while you are running uh, stuff. So it delivers everything, all of the compilation and all of the uh, low level running and binary stuff to the LLVM. That is kind of a, in, in a brief nutshell overview. So let's go to the uh, packages. So here, uh, I don't know, I think everyone is, is a little bit familiar with Visual Studio Code. If you're not, it's a nice IDE. It caters the advanced and also uh, the power users because you can do a lot of, um, of key bindings and a lot of shortcuts. So, uh, and you can also have several ex nice extensions. So here we have some extensions like R, R Studio, and Julia. We are going to go over the Julia one in a bit. But here we are in the Fire Explorer. And if you take a look at the, at the uh, bottom blue bar, it's kind of a status bar. And here you have your uh, some information about your GitHub uh, uh, repository. So we are in the main branch and we can think. And here you have the choose Julia environment. So now it's using the Julia environment version 1.8. So this is uh, your default Julia environment, kind of your root folder, your root environment. What we are going to do is we are going to change this. When we click this, uh, you can choose an environment. And a Julia environment is pretty much a folder with a project.toml file. So we are going to do that now. And we are going to pick a folder. And we are going to pick the class repo folder. So that's our folder here. And when I do that, OK, you see that, oh, it's not a Julia environment. OK. So let's do this the other way. So uh, first of all, I can come here on my gear icon, command palette. It's the same command palette that you can use in RStudio. And the uh, shortcut is the same, Control shift p so here you have a command palette that you can fuzzy search commands. So you, we are going to type Julia repo. And if you go down, there is a Julia start repo. It's the second from bottom to top. And there is a nice key binding here, also out J, out O. So if you click on that, you see that a terminal will open here. And this is going to precompile the extension. And this is something because we are using the first time this uh, environment. So it will precompile. And then you are created with a Julia terminal here. And so if we type the, uh, if we type the right bracket, so if you type the right bracket, you are going to change your REPL mode into uh, what you did. Uh, what did you click after on command palette? So I just, I just went on and said Julia, repo, and then I just click on this one. Or you can go here, and then out J, out O, and you can click enter here if you want to. So then you will be greeted by a Julia repo. So if you type the right bracket, let me close this. Let me open this one. So if you type the right bracket, you are going to be to, to change your terminal mode from the Julia to the PKG. So PKG is the uh, PKG is the package mode in Julia. So you can do the basic help, and it will give you some commands here. So the most important commands is the activate, add remove and status. So let's do a status. You can do either status or ST, but I'm lazy. I like to type as few characters as possible. So I'm going to do ST. So we are using this 
environment here. This is your uh, root environment, the default environment. This is the one that we are using here at the Julia environment. So if we do something like activate, so let's activate our current directory, which is the class repo. We do activate dot. So this will change the name or the or the folder that we are using as the project management. Now you see that when I do activate dot, I change this to class repo. So now this is a, a new environment that I'm activating in the class repo folder. And if I do a status again, it's empty. But this is the, uh, the file for the uh, class, repo pro, cl class repo project management. So this is the project.toml. So Julia uses toml files for uh, managing package versions and, and dependencies. So let's uh, add a package. So the first thing that we do to add a package, we do add. So let's do a package called benchmark tools. So this also supports autocomplete. So if you do benchmark uh, tools and then you do a tab, it will autocomplete. Oh, how do you enter package mode? You just type in right bracket in your in your repo. Then you go back, you go into package mode. To get back of package mode, you just uh, do backspace. So package mode, you type in the bracket, backspace, you go back. So you do add uh, benchmark, benchmark, and I'm looking for benchmark tools. So that's the one. Now let's add this. You will see that to the left, our Explorer tab will have a new, uh, will, will be created a new file called project tomo and manifest.tomo. So these are the two ones here. So these two files, they are the files that define a Julia environment. Oops, what did I did? Uh, okay, I might have bumped it into a different. Uh, so if it's not giving out of you, uh, just do a status before, and you need to, you need to, uh, you need to update the repository listings. So if you do a status or ST, it will automatically do this updating and then autofilling will work. If it does not work, it means that your suggestion is ambiguous and then you can spam tab a couple of times and then it will give you like, so if I just type benchmark and I, and I hit tab a couple of times, uh, oops, and if I do add, add benchmark and I hit tab a couple of times, it say, okay, which benchmark do you want? There is benchmark TI, benchmark this, this, and there is benchmark tools. So if you do benchmark T, now it autocompletes. And we can also add different stuff. So you can also do add Pluto, for example, this is another package. So let's do add Pluto, for example. So Pluto has some, a lot of dependencies. So it's pre-compiling 35 dependencies. And the nice thing about this uh, environment that, that we are creating is that it is fully re uh, reproducible and is baked into the Julia VS Code extension and also in the Julia language. So any fresh install from Julia will have uh, the ability to, for you to create and instantiate uh, packages, uh, pr uh, project environments with the same packages, the same versions, the same dependencies as uh, as another repo, as a colleague that that just sent you uh, uh, some Julia files. So you have the same thing here. Now let's uh, remove. So to remove, you do remove the the name of the package. So here I'm re uh, removing Pluto. So I remove the, the packages. Uh, that 
the, we have a nice question in the chat to what extent it is fully reproducible, like a Docker contain stable across OSs. Uh, sort of, um, it's, it's stable across Julia installs. So there are some, uh, there are some caveats when you are interoperating across OSs, especially if you are going from Unix, um, Based systems like Mac and Linux to Windows basic to Windows based systems because the file paths changes. There, there are some ways for you to do this, but yes, you have the same packages and the same dependencies, Julia packages and Julia dependencies as uh, your collaborator or as the project that you are instantiating. So fully reproducible depends on, on a lot of stuff, but from the Julia side of things, this will give you a fully reproducible Julia package and Julia dependencies. And if you're getting some errors, the package is benchmark, benchmark, oh, benchmark tools, like this uh, camel case, not just benchmark. So now let's inspect the project number file. So let's open it here. So as you can see, we have one dependency. So this is what the project formula does. It's, it only specifies the dependencies that your project has. And then let's open the manifest formula for us to take a look. So the manifest formula, there is a, uh, first there's a warning here, a comment. This is a machine generated file. Do not edit this. So this file is, not generated by you, it's generated by Julia, by a computer. But this kinds of show you, shows you all of the dependencies that, that, that Benchmark Tools needs. They are here. So Benchmark Tools uses uh, these dependencies here. So JSON, for, uh, for example. So JSON uses those dependencies here. And JSON for this project, we are using this is the unique identifier of the JSON package. This is the version that we are using. And so for the MMAP uh, file here, which is a dependencies of JSON, so it's a dependencies dependency, we are using this UUID. So this is a standard library package, so it doesn't have a version, but OpenBLAST has a version. So everything that you need to instantiate your, your, your environment, you have encoded in the project tomo the project tomo specifies the the packages that your environment uses and the manifest tomo it's machine generated it specifies all of the dependencies versions that you are using and all of the package versions that you are using so this is kind of our first stop to showcase how you can uh create projects uh, create a uh, uh, julia pro Ju uh, julia projects uh, reproducibles and how you can share those. So if you send your Julia code and the project and manifest formula, that's everything that anyone needs to run your Julia script, Julia analysis, or Julia app. So they will have the same environment as you do. So that's what I meant with fully reproducible. Jose, do you mind uh, just scrolling up a little bit and just showing people how to start back. And I, I got a few questions in the Zoom chat where people are just asking uh, at the beginning what were some of the original steps. So first of all, let's let's close this. Let's let's close this repo. So we need to open a repo, a Julia terminal. So you can come here to the gear icon, go to the command palette, and then you can fuzzy search. This is the same command palette that you have available in RStudio. It's also the same key binding, Control Shift P, as in Paul, Control Shift Papa. Uh, and then you can do Julia repo here, and then you go to the Julia start repo, which is the key binding out J, out O. And then if you select that, you're gonna open a new terminal a new Julia terminal. And now if you type the right bracket, you are going to go into pick, pick G mode. And here you can do a help and this will list all of the available, uh, all of the available commands that you have available. Uh, the Tomo files, they can be found at the root, at the, at, the, at the directory of your project. So if you do status, you see that 
we are using the class people project and it's here. Oh, so maybe you, you, you forgot to do the activate doc here. So you, you need to activate your following three working directory. So, and then if you do status, it will again show you the project Tomo, but the project Tomo will only be created if you add a package to that environment. So if you do add benchmark tool, then the, the uh, project Tomo will be uh, instantiated, created, and populated with the. Can you show again how you use the, the class repository? Uh, yeah. I don't know why we got a 502 error. Let me try again. Okay. So that was a little bit HTTP delay. So that's it. Let's go back to our terminal uh, repo. You can also take a look at other commands. There is like uh, help here. You can update stuff. You can do garbage collecting. Julia. I think from version 1.7 onwards will automatically do garbage collection for you because sometimes, so sometimes this folder here, so sometimes the Julia folder gets very big because you are instantiating a lot of different projects with different package versions. So Julia needs to have a local version of those packages and the Julia folder gets very, very big. So by default, if you are experiencing a lot of uh, big files in the Julia folder, you can do the command GC that's garbage collect and it will automatically uh, do, uh, uh, do garbage collection and remove old stuff that you don't, that you don't need. Um, that's actually like a one-on-one on how to do project management, management in Julia. Now let's go to the file number two. I, uh, I question, Jose, can you hear me okay? I, I got a question. I got a question from somebody. How did you switch over to the classroom project? Oh, you do yeah. activate uh, dot. Yeah. Yeah. And then so you are in the classroom, and then you do e, you you can do add remove package name here. And for some people, I think that's saying activating new project at, and then it doesn't have the class repo. So did you have to switch over to the class repo location? Yes, I, I had to do this file, uh, open folder, and then I went to the class repo, and then I, I did okay, and then it reloads, uh, it will reload your session to, to the class repo. So we do file, hamburger menu, file, open folder, and then you choose your class repo. And there you go. So uh, this will have your packages available, but to use a package, in R, you do something like library, my package, and in Julia, so this is in this is in, in R. So in Julia, you do using my package. So instead of having library, you have a using a statement because I, I saw a question in the chat. So once I have the package available, how do I import the package into my environment, into my repo? You do the using statement. But we are not going to cover packages in this workshop. We are just going to cover the basic Julia stuff, variables, types, operators, and so on. So let's go to the variables uh, file. Let's open 02. Now, this is similar to uh, R script. So Julia scripts, they have our extension.jl. Whereas R script that has the extension dot R, but here we can type something like X equals five and to run code in a repo, uh, you just hit shift enter anywhere and shift enter will run your code and move to the next block of code. So 
as you can see, it sent my x equals five to the repo. Uh, it kind of gave me an inline. It kind of gave me an inline uh, result from the x equals five. And also, if I go to my repo and I do x, you see that now x has value five. So by default, the VS Code extension will not echo your command in the terminal. You can change that in the settings if you want to. I won't change the defaults because it will, it will be a little bit cumbersome right now, but that's how you execute, uh, how you send commands to your terminal. You, you go wherever you are in your code block and you do shift enter and that will, uh, that will execute the command and move to the next line of code. So let's cover uh, variable, variable types. Let me just copy this here. Yeah. So first of all, we have integers. So uh, if we do type of x, which is the same command that you do in R, you see that this returns uh, int 64. So our x variable, it's an integer type with precision of 64 bits. So by default, since you are, we are running Julia in a 64-bit computer, uh, all of our types will have 64 bits of precision. So that's the case with the integers. Uh, we can also uh, have, in, uh, for example, we can also have like uh, different precision types. So if you if you want to to uh, if, you, if you don't need 64 bits of precision, you can create another uh, x. So let's create, let's see, let's create another uh, uh, x int 8. You can say that this is equal at int. And here I have a nice um, autocomplete stuff. So int 8 of 5. So now if I run this, and if I do type of x int 8, you see that now this is an int 8, uh, 8 bits. So I think if I do size of uh, x, you see that this is 8 bytes. And if I do size of x int 8, you see that this will be 1 byte. So if you don't want to represent something uh, with 64 bits, you just need 8 bits. Uh, sorry, eight, yeah, eight bits. You can pretty much do int eight to instantiate an integer with eight bits of precision. So in Julia, you are free to specify uh, the precision of your of your how much memory your integer allows. And we also have other stuff like uh, int uh, one twenty eight. If you need like big stuff, you can also have those here. Uh, so we have integers. Now let's move to floats. So let's do another one. Y. Y equals 3.14. So if I do this, and if I do type of Y, you see that Y is a float 64. So that's a float point uh, that's similar to double uh, in, in R. So this is a floating point number with 64 bits of precision. and Similar, we can also do uh, a y float. Uh, I think we have, let's do 32. We can do float uh, 32, and then you do 3.14. And if you do type of y float 32, you see that this is a float 32. So these are the most common numerical types in Julia the floating points and the integers. And this is similar to the integers and, and, and the real number in math uh, terms. And we also have different types. We also have the Boolean types. So Julia, we, we have true and false. So if you, if you do something like type of true, you see that this is the Boolean. And if you do type of false, you see that this is a Boolean also. Uh, 
as you can see, there are some things in Julia that are like um, that are like a title case. So float sixty four. You see that we have float sixty four. Float sixty four. This is a title case. We also have something like uh, why big float equals big float. Uh, 3.14, so this is a big float. So you see that this is also a title case, big float with B, capital B, capital F. So everything in Julia, this is a developer convention that is widely adopted uh, in Julia, both in Julia base, also in Julia packages, that everything that is title case can be three things, can be so, Everything that is title case can be three things. One, a type. So that's why big float, float 64, float 32, int 8, and all of those other things, they are title, title case because they are type. Two, a mojo. And three, a package. And Mojo and package, they are kind of interchangeably. So deep inside Julia, uh, packages, they are modules and modules can be packages. So if you are crossing something that is title case, is either a package or a type. Everything else is lowercase or is snake case. So functions, variables, methods, everything else is uh, either uh, everything else is 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 snake case. Only things that are title case are types and packages or modules. That's why we don't have true like in Python or true like in R. It's all lowercase. Now let's go over to the string type. There is a Small caveat here because let's do S. Uh, Julia is awesome. And let's add some Unicode. So let's do something like, uh, I don't know, let's do a cat Unicode. There you go. Julia is awesome. We can do that in Julia. Uh, so if we do type of S, you see that this is a string. Now, there is one caveat in Julia is that uh, strings use double quotes, whereas uh, characters use single quotes. So if you are trying to create a string using uh, single quotes, like you could do in R or in Python, uh, you see that our uh, VS code is already warning for an error. So this will error, This we have a pressing error. So let's let's try to run this code and see what error it throws out. So character literal contains multiple characters. That's because single quotes, they are only used for, uh, only used for chars. So let's do C1. So this is J. So this is a char, so I can do that. And if I do uh, pipe off, you one, you see that it's a char type. So single quotes are for single characters and um, double quotes are for uh, strings. And of course you can have, um, you can have Unicode characters. So let's do a nice Omega here. So there you go, Omega. And these are like same as in latex. So if you do, if you see a type of C2, this is also a char type, is now a Unicode char type, but it's a char type. So we can also use, um, we can also use that. So let me see the question. In Python, we do a lot of string parameter and char is, uh, oh, you you want to do a string interpolation or not string interpolation? You want to do uh, 
to do like an app string to, to replace. Yes, you can do that. So let's do something like print. So in Julia, we do print line. So you do print line and then you do my string is, and then you do dollar S2, S1. Now, when I type this, oh, S1, oh, it's just S, sorry. There you go. My string is Julia is awesome. So you, you can do interpolation with the S here. And also you can do, if you wanted to interpolate something, you can do my calculation is, so if you want to do something like that is that, that, you, that you need more things to do, like one plus one, then you can open and close parentheses here. And now you see my calculation is two. So. Uh, no, not replacing, just actually outputting or to the user. Yes, you can do something like show. So at everything that starts with an at in Julia is a macro. So we can do at show uh, my string equals, uh, so let's do at show x. So here it will output uh, in your repo what is uh, the command of, of x. So it will it kind of give you more information of x. So this is a nice way if you are running a uh, standalone script and you want to output stuff to, uh, to the repo, you can annotate the lines of code with add show, and this will be printed out in the repo as um, a kind of information. Uh, how to do Omega and Unicode? So the way you do Omega and uh, LaTeX stuff, so map stuff, is pretty much like you're doing LaTeX. So uh, Omega here and if you don't know, if you uh, receive a file from a, a collaborator or a colleague and you have no idea, there's a lot of math and you have no idea how to do this, you just copy the symbol here and you go to your to the repo, you type in the question mark. So if you type in the question mark in your terminal, it will change your terminal from the green Julia to the help uh, yellow repo. So now you can cl uh, click here, do a paste, and why did it not paste? So let's try again, paste. Okay, it's not pasting. So I'm gonna do control shift V to paste it in my repo. And then I paste the Unicode symbol. And I said, oh boy, how do I do this? And of course the help will say, okay, Omega can be typed by doing backslash capital Omega and then hit tab. So that's how we do it. Oh, okay, I got it, Omega. And then I hit tab, there you go, you have it. Also for Unicode stuff, you can come here, copy this, and then you can go to your help repo, paste this. How do I paste this Unicode here? Oh, you can do this, backslash cat2. Okay, let's, let's try that. So cat2 and tab, there you go, you have it here. You can also assign variables. So you can say something like uh, credit card. So, okay, I, my credit card is very big. So I have, I don't know, uh, $10,000 in my credit card. So I can do something like this. And then if I, if I come here and do credit card, you see that is a variable that returns at 10,000. So I can also assign uh, variables to Unicode characters or Unicode strings. It also works. <coughs> In the help mode, you just go to your REPL and you type in the question mark. So question mark, it turns to the, to the help REPL. So here you can do fuzzy search. You can, you can take any, any function here. So we can take a look at the documentation of the type of function. So here you, we, we get a nice uh, doc string on how to use the type of. So you do type of of something and then you get the concrete type of the X that you are calling. You can also take a look at the element type if you want to, it's a, a sister function. And you have some examples here. And finally, uh, whenever you come uh, in contact with a type and you have no idea what to do with that type, there's a nice handy function called methods with. 
I'm going to I'm going to to explain methods further down in the workshop. So if you do methods with type of the X thing, so just to remember, if I highlight the type of and I, I do control enter, this just send the selection to the repo. So if I do this, you see that this is an int64, the X. So if I do methods with type of, uh, I, uh, why it's take, oh, it's because there's a lot of things here. <laughs> so you have kind of, uh, 288 functions that you can use that accept as one of the arguments uh, int64. So anytime that, that, that you come into a, a certain type and you want to see, okay, what are all of the options that I have available to for functions that take as argument this certain type, int64. You can do methods with the type. You can either do type of the of of the object, or you can do int64 here, it's the same. So this will pretty much output everything that you have available here. So you can do stuff like downloads uh, response. There is like, um, uh, uh, there, there is like uh, less than plus uh, a lot of things here. So a lot of things here. So a lot of functions that use the, uh int you can convert to float for example you 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 have this function here and the nice thing is that it shows where in the file is defined it so that's a nice handy function for you to have it whenever you encounter a new type do methods with th that type as an argument and julia will spit it out everything that you have available functions to use with that type and then you can do a, a, a further down uh, help uh, to that. So there's a, another nice question. It's the last question before we, we, we do a small uh, five minute break. So we are, if you go to the Julia extension here, here you see that you have uh, what, what you are familiar with, with the R Studio, you have the workspace, which is similar to your uh, environment app panel in RStudio. So here I have uh, similar. Uh, so I have X, Y, y int, Y, Y big float, my credit card here with $10,000. Uh, and then I have stuff packages that are already loaded by default when I start a fresh, a fresh Julia session. We have base, core, and interactive utils if you are running this in, uh, if you're running this. And then uh, you can uh, come here to the documentation. So here in the documentation, I don't know why this is not working. So this should have like a small search window for you to search the documentation. I don't know why it's not working. Uh, maybe a bug in my specific machine, but this do uh, documentation would have something here. And also you can hover over. So if you hover over any of those things, you get a nice doc string here also. So you have the, the documentation here. So there are uh, several ways that you can find how to read uh, documentation or help about a function. You can leave the hover over. So let's hover over the print line. Uh, but if this window is too small for you, you go to the repo and you do uh, print line here. There you go, or you can fuzzy search. So I don't know, uh, let's do vector. So if you fuzzy search here, you can, you have like a lot of things that, that, that it kind of searched that, that kind of fuzzy match with, with the thing that you just uh, type it. So you can search all of those functions here. You can search something like parse. So there you go. You have like several other functions that you that you can take a look. Try, try parse, parse, a lot of functions. So that's it. And so that's it for variables and types. There is a question: How do you delete a variable? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, we do have delete delete bank. So delete bank. So this is going to delete something in a collection. Uh, I 
honestly don't know how to delete a variable. So maybe remove rm. rm is for files. Yeah. I don't know how to delete. Uh, maybe reset. Let's see, reset. Uh, no. Uh, that's a good question. I I never deleted a variable in in Julia, uh, but uh, one way for you to find out, I would suggest you take a look at the documentation in Julia. So we go to Julia Lang and go to the documentation. Oh, it's clear. Oh, thanks. See, you always learn something in your own workshop. No, it's not clear. No, we don't we, we don't have any clear. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good try. I'm going to cover those bank functions in after the break. So for now, uh yeah. <laughs> for now let's uh, do a five minute break. So now it's uh it's eleven twelve in Easter time, the East Coast time. So we are going to get back on eleven seventeen. So a five minute break for a bathroom break or grab some water. Mine cup is empty, so I'm going to fill this in. Also, and be back in uh, five minutes. I'm going to pause the, the recording. Uh, sometimes I forget to resume the recording. If I don't, uh, if I don't uh, res uh, resume the recording, please let me know in the chat or open the mic. So I'm going to. Stop the recording for now. Recording. There you go. We are. Being recorded. Oh boy, she's loud. Okay. So uh, we are back. So let's now move to the third file, Boolean comparisons. So let's showcase. Uh, so I guess everyone is seeing my. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's showcase uh, some Boolean comparisons. This is very similar to R. So for users coming coming um, coming from uh, R, uh, you you find yourself right at home with those boolean comparisons. So first of all, um, we can use the and. So if you do something like true and false. So this is going to return false. Here. And then we have the or. So if you do something like true or oops, true or false, this is going to return true. So that's how we do uh, and and or uh, comparisons in uh, in uh, Julia. And we also have the not, the bank. So not true is going to be false. We can also mix and match those. We can do something like not true and false. So this is going to return true. And we can add as much nested uh, Boolean comparisons and operations, uh, nesting those using parentheses. That's very similar to R. Now, why? would we use if you take a look there is uh there is also the single and percent and this also works but that is not a good practice because if you go to your repo the help mode and you type in the n percent help and you take a look at the documentation you see that this is bitwise end so, and you can take a look at the tree value logic here in the Wikipedia. But this is a bitwise end. I do not uh, recommend this for most of, the, of your scripts. Uh, you would want to do something like double n percent. This is short circuiting Boolean end. So this will short circuit and it's usually, it's used a lot throughout Julia code and throughout Julia packages. So this is the one that, that you want to use. And also the same for the bitwise end. So this is a bitwise end. 
And if you do double uh, vertical bars, you have the short circuiting Boolean OR. So this is your uh, Boolean OR. We also have the XOR here if you ever need to use that. And that's uh, our Boolean operators. We have AND, OR, and NOT. Now for the numerical comparisons, this is where things get a little bit interesting uh, because we have the equality. So five equals five. This is a equality. And you also have a inequality. So you have five not equal five, and this is false. But you can also use LaTeX. So you can do something like five and the LaTeX Unicode command for not equal is backslash and E. And here you have a nice like textbook math, not equal. So you do five not equal and this also works. So you can use also Unicode com in the comparisons, in the, in the numerical comparisons. So equality, you can use the equal equal, the, the uh, bank uh, equal, to showcase that something is not equal. And you can also use the, the, the Unicode, oops, the Unicode not equal tab. We have a question in the chat. Uh, can Julia be run from within RStudio? Yes, it can. I think you can also make a quarto document using, using Julia. Uh, yeah, using using Julia, you can run in R Studio, but uh, I would recommend if you're running Julia code, I would re I would re uh, recommend the VS Code because this is the default and official um, uh, integrated in uh, development environment IDE that that Julia language supports. So you have the best experience using VS Code, but I think you can run. Julia code within R Studio, and you can also definitely run, uh, compile a quarter document using Julia code. It works. And for the less than, it's the same. We we have like zero less than five. This is false, and we can also do five less or equal than five. Also true. Oh, sorry. This is this is true. This is true, and this we can also do greater, uh, lower, lower than, lower equal using the latex command. So this is LE. And if we do LE, we get a nice, um, we get a nice, so this is L backslash LE tab. We get a nice Unicode character math for that. So we can also do that if you want to. And the same way we can do with uh, greater than. So here I can change all of the signs here. And the LaTeX command for greater than is GE, greater or equal than. So GE, and here we are using GE, and these are all false, true, and false. So that's how we do Boolean comparisons in Julia. We are just getting warm up, so. Don't worry, let's move now to types. Uh, let's showcase how the type system works in, in Julia. So there is a, something, a, a paradigm in computer science called object-oriented programming. So we have object oriented programming or O. OOP, as it's called, and Julia is not OOP. So Julia is not object-oriented programming, but Julia does support custom types. Uh, and, and that's what we are going to go uh, over in the final session of the final uh, file of our session. So first, let me show you the type system in Julia. So we have two different types of type, two different uh, 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 versions of type. We have a concrete type and an abstract type. 
So this cannot be instantiated. So you cannot do X equal an abstract type and concrete uh, can be instantiated as a, as a, 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 an object or a, or a variable. So that's the difference between the types. So let me just close something here, there you go. So how do we find if a type is concrete or abstract? We have a nice function called is abstract type, and then you pass in a type, so like int 64, and this will return false. Let me just, because uh, int 64 is concrete type, and you also have is, concrete type int 64, so this will turn to be true. Yes, int 64 is concrete. We already know that because we can do something like x equals five, and if we do type of x, we see that uh, x is an integer 64. So, so if we can instantiate an object, a variable with this type, it is uh, concrete. Otherwise, it is abstract. But how do we know if, uh, how do we know what uh, types there are? So we can do something like super types, super types. Uh, let's do first super type, singular. Super type int 64. Now, if I do this, you see that uh, int is a subtype of signed. And if we do the same now for sign it, you see that sign it is a subtype of integer. So let's let's keep going down. Uh, uh, oops, uh, integer. Yeah, that that was the statistician inside of me. Sorry about that. Integer. Uh, then it's a subtype of real, and we can keep going down. So real, it's a subtype of number. And let's go down. And I think number, I think we are done. Number is a subtype of any. So any is always the super type of every type in Julia. So every type is the subtype of any. So this is kind of the hierarchy of abstract types. Oh, let's see if those types are abstract. So let's see, is abstract type signed? Yes, it is. So let's see. Can I do x equals sine it five? Uh, yes, I can do. But there is a one one caveat here. If I do type of x, it's a concrete type. So whenever you try to instantiate an abstract type, Julia will do implicit conversion to the most close to the closest uh, concrete type for you. So that's why you cannot instantiate abstract types. You don't get an error, but you get, um, or maybe you get an error. Let, let me see, x equals number. This, no, you don't get an error. This will pretty much uh, do an automatic conversion on that abstract type into a concrete type. But that's the difference between, and also you can do something, uh, you don't need to do super type each type for you to get the. So let let me move this up here. So for you to get the. All of the all of the super types of a certain type, you can do super types here, and then int sixty four. So here you get a nice uh, tuple here. So we get we have int sixty four. Then int sixty four is a subtype of signed which is a subtype of integer, which is a subtype of real, which is a sub subtype of number, which is a subtype of any. We can also do the same with float64. So here you see that float64 is a subtype of abstract float, is a subtype of a real, a number, and any. So you see that we, we can build a tree of hierarchies of the types in, in, in Julia using that. We can also take a look at string here. So string has only one subtype, one supertype, which is abstract string. So the hierarchy is a little bit less convoluted, like, like the other ones. We can also do a is a comparison. We have a nice operator called is a. So we can do a, uh, you can do five 
is a uh, in 64 and you and you and you get a true that also works for abstract types is assigned yes it is so is it uh, an integer yes it is and of course you can do is any yes it is so you we can also do something like julia is a string yes it is and you can also do julia is a abstract string and yes it is true so if you do julia is a number you get an a uh, false so this evaluates to false so you can use the you can use the yes nothing has a type let's see so we have some special uh types in julia we have the nothing and the missing. So if you take a look at type of nothing, you get nothing as title case. So we do have a type called nothing, which uh, if we do something like uh, subtypes, not sub, I think it is subtypes. Do you have subtypes? I think yes. Let me see, nothing. Uh, no, it's not subtypes. Okay. if we do Super types of nothing. Uh, okay, so this is a, a special type. Uh, it has only one value. So type nothing can only have one value, which is nothing. And the missing, it's the same thing. So if you do uh, type of missing, we see that it's title case missing. So missing title case is a type. Missing lowercase is the value, is the instantiation of missing. So we have those two very special types here. Missing we use a lot in data wrangling and nothing we use a little bit, but not so much. More like if you are programming a package, if you are altering a package, you are going to use nothing a little bit, but missing you use a lot in data wrangling because missing values, that's our NAs. So we represent NAs in Julia uh, pretty much like, so this is our NAs with um, missing. That's a great question, thanks. Now, um, I, I already showcased what, what is float 64, float 32. So we can do something like, like float 32, 5.0 is a abstract float. We get a true value here, but if we say that this is a float 64, uh, float 64, you see that this, this evaluates to false. So uh, that's kind of the hierarchy between types. We have abstract types that they are abstract. They represent a certain abstraction from concrete types and they have a hierarchy like we saw it here. So we saw that, um, let's do super types. We saw that uh, we have int64, it's a subtype of signed, integer, real, number, and any. All of those after int64, they are subtypes, uh, they are uh, abstract types, and they cannot be instantiated. If you try to instantiate, um, an abstract type, it gets automatically converted to the nearest, the closest uh, concrete type. So for example, I get the signed, uh, I get the signed abstract type that will pretty much uh, convert into an int64. So those are the types, the primitive types in Julia. Now let's move to what we call composite types, or I like to call them as containers. There is a double quotes there because this is not an official nomenclature is the way I like to, to re, uh, refer to, to those types. And containers, they are a uh, type that have, um, they have something like uh, curly brackets in Julia. So let's, let's start with the, with the vector. So, the way it specifies vectors in Julia is pretty much similar to lists in Python or to vectors in MATLAB. So this is similar to C123 in R. Now, if we run this, 
we see that this is a three element vector of, and, and the elements are of type in 64. So whenever you see this uh, curly brackets, this means that this is a collection. This is a type that is compositive. It holds other types. Could be a vector that holds other vectors or a vector that holds int 64 like it is in this case. So every time that you see curly, bra curly brackets in Julia, it's just the type that is inside the collection. So the collection is vector. And we have uh, int 64 as the element type. And if we do something like type of, oops, type of this thing here, You see that Julia will tell us that vector of int 64 is just an alia, an, an alias, a shorthand, a nickname for array of a certain type of certain dimensionality. So one dimensional arrays are vector. So uh, we can also do the same with matrices. So the way we specify matrices we, is we use the MATLAB convention. So we first do one row, then we do a semicolon, the second row, four, five, six. So that's how we specify matrices. So we are getting this row vector and we are concatenating with this other row vector. So these are two rows by three column matrix. So if we do this, we get back that this is a two by three matrix of int 64. So the collection type is matrixes, uh, matrix and the element type is int 64. So that's how we read those curly brackets in Julia. They generally refer to a collection and, and the thing that is inside the curly brackets, brackets is the, the element of the, that it's inside this collection. So just to make this a little bit more interesting, let's make this a uh, float 64 matrix. So four, five, six, there you go. Now, now we have a two by three matrix of float 64. And if we do type of this thing here, you see that this is a matrix 64, float 64, which is just an alias, a shorthand notation for array of a certain type. So the collection is an array. And array, we have the type and the dimensionality. So array of type float 64 with dimensionality equals two. So a two dimensional array, it's a matrix. So that's uh, what we learned back in, in high school. Let's see. Uh, oh, how do I assign a name to those things? Yeah, that's, that's really easy. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Let's do X back. It's this, so one, two, three. And let's do X matrix here. Uh, oh, Y matrix, because this is, this is floats. Y matrix is like this. So then if you type in X, you see that it's a X back, it's a vector. And if you do Y back, oh, Y matrix, you see that is a matrix. And all of, all of those collections are raised and vectors, they are um, array of a certain type and a certain dimensionality equals n. So if you want to create tensors, uh, pretty much will be an array of the element type, and this will be three uh, greater than greater or equal greater than or equal to three as the dimensionality. So all of the uh, array collections. They are pretty much vector and matrices are pretty much alias for that. So everything boils down into array of certain type and certain dimensionality here. And of course we can index those. So if I do X back one, I get the first element of the X vector. And I can do also indexing here. So first to second element. So I get the first to the second element. So indexing, in Julia, they are pretty much like R. They are inclusive and they are one index. Uh, and also, if I need to index a matrix, 
I do Y matrix to get the first element, I get the first element. And if I want to get the first row, but the, but the third column, I get one tree, so similar to R. And also I can slice those. So I, I just want the first, second uh, row, but the third column. So I just get the third column and then I get back this as a vector. So it's very similar to R indexing. There are some nice uh, keyword arguments. So we have begin and end. So we can also do X back uh, begin. So you, you get the first element. You can also do begin plus one, you get the second element. Uh, you can also do end, you get the last element and end minus one, you get the second to last element. So if you're doing like a for loop that we are going to showcase in a bit, and you need to go from the first, uh, from the second element to the second to last, you can do something like begin, begin plus one and minus one. And of course this will give only one element because we the vector is one, two, three. And this works also for the matrix. So if you do Y matrix and we go in the first dimension, uh, we go in the first dimension, we gonna get this the the we are going to get just the the last row, but we are going to get the the second to last column. We get back only the uh only the second row and the second to last column. So those keyword arguments, they work any way you want in indexing or slicing arrays and vectors and matrices. So any questions in data types and, and collections? There are more collections. We have dictionaries, tuples. I'm not going to showcase those in this session because it, we have very few. Uh, time is scarce, and I want to go over other things that I think that are more important for a beginner to learn about Julia. But if there is any questions, feel free to either open the mic or ask in the chat. Okay, let's move to the Fifth uh, bio. This is the if, else, if, and else. So the way we do a uh, uh, the way we do if, uh, else, if, and and else statements in Julia is uh, we do a keyword argument that this is if, and if you just do if, there is a nice uh, two tip. In, in VS Code for you to autocomplete. If you click on this, or you, if you hit enter, or if you hit tab, this will auto expand for you. So if first you do uh, expression to be to evaluate and thing to run if true. And then we finish with an end block. So that's how we do if expressions in Julia. So let's do something here. So if, um, if let's do five equals five, then you are going to print line five is equal to five. And so you see that this, this code got evaluated and got printed. The nice thing is that Julia is not sensitive to white space. So you can do something like this, also works. Uh, it's just that there's a convention for us to indent those code blocks within those uh, keywords and end expressions. So we, you see that this pattern, keyword, and then the end to signal, to signal Julia that I'm done with the statement. They will repeat a lot in Julia, but they are uh, they they don't depend on white space. But uh, as a convention, we indent white space because it's easy for us humans to see what's going on inside a code block, like the if. Uh, we can also add an else. So let me let me copy this. So the way we add an else to this statement is before the end, we do else uh, print line another thing 
So if we change this, if we do six equals five, uh, here it will print uh, another thing. So that's how we we chain an if with an else. Uh, don't don't do this mistake here. So if something, then another thing, and then you do else here. That does not work, and it will give you another error. So the if and else they should be in the same code block before the end keyword argument, the end statement. So that's how you do an if else uh, control flow statement in Julia. You can also do combined, uh, com compound uh, control flow statements using the else if here. So you start with the if. Uh, let's do what is the value of x? x equals 5. So if x is not equal 5, uh, print line uh, x is not 5. And then you do uh, else if x is not equal to 6. You are going to do a print line uh, x is not 6. And you can also do else uh, print line. I don't know. I don't know what x is, for example. So if you run this, you see that it will pretty much uh, execute the first else if here, and we can we can compound as much else ifs as you want. So we can do a lot of else if here. So else if something else, and then you can do another else if, and so on. So the only caveat is that you need to sandwich those uh, you you need to compound those before the end. And it it has to follow this order. First is the if, then followed by optionally an else if, and one or more else if, optionally an else, and then you have to finish with an end uh, statement. That's how you do compound uh, control flow statements in Julia. I left some exercises for you. Uh, I'm not going to cover those exercises here in the workshop. Uh, you are going to see the solutions here in this uh, folder here, solutions. So this exercise is just for to, uh, to get you familiar with Julia. Once you learn this, uh, once you go over the workshop and you learn a lot of Julia stuff, I would highly recommend. So if you go to uh, Euler project, you see that. Uh, this is very nice for you to learn how to code in a new language. You can do the exercise about the, the problems of the Euler project. You, you, you have also a nice RSS feed, so you can take a look whenever um, new projects, they are the new problems, they are released. But the Euler uh, project, you can try to do those in, Pum, in, in Julia. So it's a nice way for you to get acquainted with the language, is try to do Euler problems in that language. So that's how I would do it. But I, I have some uh, if else exercise. So first of all, test if, if a number is a multiple of three, five, or seven, and print which quadrant in the Cartesian plane a point is located. So those are the uh, two uh, exercises that I leave for you. So any questions in the if, else, if, and else statements, what we call in computer science control flow statements? All right, let's move to the, oh, is there a kind of case statement? Um, not in Julia base, but there is a package called match.jl, which does exactly that. So if you go to, to this thing here, so you can use a match as a package, and then you do match item begin, pattern result, pattern result, and then you, you can have several of complex match stuff.
There you go. You have this package here. And this package, the nice thing about this package is that it doesn't have any dependencies. So you are, it's very easy for you to add it to your project environment because it's just a few lines of code and it doesn't have any dependencies here. So you can inspect the project Tomo in any package and you are going to see here that the dependencies that it has in none, it just has some compact bounds, which I highly encourage everyone who is going to go over Julia to learn what are compound bounds, but this is a nice package that that does this. So it doesn't have any dependencies here. So if a package had dependencies for you, so let's go to dataframes.jl, for example. So if you take a look at dataframes.jl, which is a very nice package, it's kind of the deployer. If you take a look at the project Tomo, you see that there is a tons of dependencies. So if you are going to add data frames into your project, uh, you are going to add all of those dependencies as well. Uh, there is the modulo operator. Yes, we have the modulo operator is this one here. So five modulo two, there you go, one. So it's pretty much the same in all of the other languages. I think you can also do mod uh, if you want to. You can also do mod five two that also works one if you want to, or you can use the operator. It's your call. Both of them works. So let's go for the um, text, the for loops. And then after this one, we are going to do another break because we are almost in the noon uh, second hour of our workshop, almost finishing the second hour of our workshop. So uh, for loops. So I left some exercises here. I left also some Euler exercise from, from some problems from the project Euler exercise that are really nice to do. Um, so the way we do for loops in Julia is pretty much like for uh, some placeholder in some iterable. Uh, you want to do something with placeholder. So that's that's the the, the general uh, uh, structure of a for loop. So let's see. So for uh, I. Everyone will use i in one to ten. So one to ten, this is uh, so if we if you go in type of one to ten, you see that this is a unit range. So this is a range. That's how we construct ranging ranging Julius. So for i in one to ten, let's do print line number i. There you go. And then it, we with one end. If we run this, our repo spells out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that's how we do a for loop. The nice thing about for loops is that we can do all of the nice Julia stuff. So if you want to have like a mathy thing, you can do in here. That works. So for i in one to ten, that also works. You can do the latex in, and it does the same thing here. So that also works. So that's how we do a, a for loop uh, in in Julia that also works for 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 vectors. So, for example, you can do something like let's recreate our x vec. So one, two, three, four for now. There you go. Uh, and you can do something like uh, for for element in x vec. You are going to print line what is this element for me there you go now we have one two three uh where is the four? Oh, i need to be yeah let me yeah now we have one two three four you can also do uh other things so you can also do something like so let's change the our x spec let's do four three two one you can also do from um 
element or now for index in one until length of the x vec, you are going to print the index. So this is a way for you to, to get the index of each element of a iterable, like a vector. Now you get the one, two, three, four. And if you do this, you get the four, three, two, one. That's, uh, that's a nice way for you to use uh, for loops in Julia. But they are very similar. And you see that this pattern here is repeating itself. So we have a keyword argument. We, uh, not argument we have a keyword a keyword and then we that is very special so we have a for loop here and we have to tell julia when that keyword is done with the end statement that's that's why we have the end here after each one of those special keywords the if else else if else and the uh for for the for loop So we are on 11.58 AM. So we are almost close to our uh, second hour, to, our, to, 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 our, to finish our second hour and going straight into the, our first hour, our third hour. So let's do another five minute break. So now it's 11.59. Let's get back. Uh, so let's get back 12.05. So I'm going to give you one more minute extra for you. So see you in five minutes. Let me stop the, let me pause the, the recording. I'm recording. Okay, so. Okay. Um, so uh, there's a nice question in, in the chat. I'd like to know your thoughts on, of using Julia over R in Python. Let's move this as you suggested to the end of the session. We can have a 10 minute uh, rant on that one or an um, open, uh, open, open uh, mic maybe on on that one after the recording and and everything so everyone can express them themselves uh, without being recorded. Uh, so let's move to the while loop. So the while loop is pretty much uh, the same thing as the for loop. Um, we have the while statement and then we put here something uh, expression to be evaluated and then we run this uh, run this code if true so we can do something like while uh so let me just comment this out there you go you can say something like uh uh Let me see a nice, uh, so let's do something like, this is not a good thing that I'm teaching, but this is just for teaching purposes for the while loop. So let's set n equals 10. So you'll do something like while n less n equals one. So while n less than five, you are going to print line n and you are going to increment n plus equal n plus equal one. So I think this should work. Let me take a look. There you go. This should work, but it's not good for you to mix local and global hopes, but that, that's an advanced topic that doesn't fit this introduction uh, workshop, but that's how we do while loop. So pretty much is the same pattern that we saw before. We, ha we have a special keyword, here is the while, and then we do the expression here, and we do the code block to be evaluated if this expression is true, and then we finish our end, our, our while uh, block with the end statement. So that's how we do while loops. In, uh, in Julia. So I want to move now to two topics that they are very advanced, very, not advanced, but, but very precious to Pumas, to, to, to Julia. And if I said Pumas, I'm sorry, uh, I meant Julia. 
So they are, they are very important to Julia, which is the functions and the struct. Uh, because Julia, the functions are very special. And also the structs, they are what we call user-defined types. So you can create any user-defined type you want. And you can do very powerful stuff with functions and those structs. So um, this is kind of the, the best part of the workshop. Uh, because this will showcase all of the uh, powerfulness, all of the power of the Julia language. So functions, how do we do functions? We use the same pattern. So function, and then you do like functioning, uh, arguments, and then you do some computation, and then you return some result, and this is your function. But it's the same pattern as you saw. We, we have a keyword, we have something inside the keyword, and then we end the keyword with the end statement. So that's how we define functions in Julia. So we can have something like function uh, return Julia here, for, uh, uh, for example. And this takes no arguments. And here we have something that returns uh, Julia is awesome, the string. And then we do the end statement. So now if we call this function return, so let me just put a placeholder here, X, so we don't scroll down all the way when I do the shift enter. So let's do return, where are you? Return Julia. Then this is returns the string Julia is awesome. So that's how we do uh, functions in Julia. So we can do uh, something like short form, also assigning it. So we can do return Julia to. This is uh, Julia is truly awesome. And here we have something like this. So if your function is very compact, you can also express it as in this short form here. So these two functions, these two ways that you uh, specify a function, they are similar, they are the same. It just depends on your uh, objective. So if your function is very, very short, you can use the short assignment form or you can use the regular form, it's up to you. So if we run this and if you do something like return Julia to, then you see that Julia is really awesome. This also works. So that's how we specify a function in Julia. Now, uh, in Julia, we have distinctions between what we call position arguments and keyword arguments. So position arguments, they are specified using positions. So the first, the second, and the third argument. So let's, let's create a, a function like this. Let's create, I'm going to use the short form assignment because those are like compact functions. So let's create a function called, uh, let me see, uh, numbers. So this is going to take x and y. And this is going to pretty much um, return uh, x plus y. There you go. Let's do add numbers. There you go. So, this function here has uh, two position arguments. Now let's create a function called um, exponentiate numbers. So this is going to take an x. Now I'm going to use the semicolon. And this is how we tell Julia that we are done with position arguments. So this function only takes one position argument because that's the only one argument is specified before the semicolon. Now everything after the semicolon are keyword arguments. So let's do base equals, I'm gonna do an Euler here. So base equals E. And for those, uh, if I do backslash Euler, this is the E constant in Julia. So let's do base E. And this is going to do X, 
Uh, how do I do this? X. Uh, I always forget. Oh, even better. Let's do a base. Or let's do a base elevated by x. There you go. Something like this. So now this function has one position argument and one keyword argument. Now, uh, if we call this add numbers, uh, one and two, we get back three. If we call exponentiate numbers, if I call just with two, I get back 7.3. But if I do two and then base equals 10, I get back 100. So you see that I can override my keyword argument here. So we have this distinction. And of course, if I do this, also works, but that is not a good practice in Julia. But if I do this, I get an error. And the error is there is no method matching exponentiated. There, there, there is no function signature exponentiate number that takes two position arguments, both of type int 64. So the closest candidate is, I found the closest thing that you are trying to do, I found it, is exponentiate numbers that takes an any because we haven't specified what is the type of x, so it takes the type any and has a keyword argument called base. And this is defined in this file here in line 23. And that's pretty much it. It's the file number eight, line 23. So that's how I read the, uh, that's how I read the, uh, this error message. And that's the difference between positional and, and uh, keyword arguments. Position arguments, they come before the semicolon and they are specified by positions. The first argument is always, is always the first. They are not interchangeable. And keyword arguments, they come after the position arguments by uh, delimiting those with a semicolon. So that's how we do it. So if you do exponential numbers, uh, base equals 10, we get what we want to do. So now let's cover uh, function versus methods because you see that there is this word here called method. What is this? So in Julia, we have what we call function. A function is pretty much what you saw, add numbers, exponential numbers, and so on. But we have methods. And methods are different ways that you can call a function. So let me showcase this to you. So let me do a round number. So we have a round number x. And this round number x is going to be the round of x, OK? So if I run this, I get round number is a generic function with one method. Now I'm going to do round number. Now I'm going to say the type of the argument with double column. And this is, this is a very strict uh boundary that i'm putting here so if this is a float 64 you are going to do round x and i also going to create a new one called round number if this is an int 64 you are going to just return x because i don't need to round any integers so if i execute the the line 32 here I get back that now round number is a generic function with two methods because the function is round number, but I have two ways to call the round number. The, the, the X, which since I'm not giving a type for this argument, it automatically takes the type of any. So any whatsoever X that I pass to the round number, it will, it will do this behavior here. Now I can do the round number uh, x with a float. So this, this is going to do the same behavior. And I also creating a third one, which is round number. If it is an integer 64, it's, ju it's just going to return the uh, x. So it's not going to do any operation here because I don't need to round an integer. Now, if I do a macro called which, 
So if I do round number, let's do um, let's do first a float 64, 5.5. So this which tells me which function, which method is being called whenever I run this. So this tells me that it's being called the round number for x for, the, for an argument x, a first and single position argument x that is of type float 64. Now, uh, what happens if I do which round number five? So this is going to tell me that now the function that is being called is the round number which takes an x that is an int 64. Now, if I do something like, OK, what if I call with an integer 8 here? So 8-bit integer. Now it's going to use the round number uh, which doesn't specify any type. And this is much more than uh, an annotation. It is a rule. So Julia will not. Uh, it will follow this rule uh, exactly as it is. So it's not like a type annotation that you see in Python because type annotation is pretty much like a, an IOU. So it's a promise. Yeah, please use this type. No, Julia will be strict in the rules. So let me show you something. So let me create a new function called uh, return uh, one. So this function return one, it's going to take. Uh, any abstract float, OK, any float whatsoever, either float 64, float 32, float, float 16. And this is going to return exactly um, abstract float as a string, OK? So I'm going to do this. Now, if I do return 1 with 5.5, it works. If I do return 1 with 5, I get an error. So there is no way. There is no method that for a return one function that takes a single position argument in 64. The only thing that I have is return one that takes any abstract float. So this returns an error. It doesn't do any conversion. It returns an error. So it's a very strict rule. And this is what, what, what's happening here. Another way to do, I can, I can call the methods function in the round number. And this function will output what are all of the ways that I can use the method, the, the round number function. What are, all of, what are all of the methods for the round number function? What are all of the different custom behaviors or function signatures that I have from the round numbers function? So that's the difference between method and function. And that's a, a kind of a a segue into multiple dispatch, what is the, what I call the crown jewel of, of Julia, what Julia does that, that makes it uh, uh, fast and very dynamic and very nice for you to do stuff using it. It's the, it's the multiple dispatch. Now, um, let me show what, so this is single dispatch. This is custom behavior based in one argument type, but we can have multiple dispatch. And very few languages, I think only Julia, of the successful languages, they achieve to do multiple dispatch. You can have single dispatch that's sometimes called polymorphism in other languages, but multiple dispatch, uh, oh, we, oh, we have a question. So in Julia, we won't need assertions for inputs as we do in R in write functions, assert that. No, you, you can have assertions here. You can have something like, how do I do assert? Assert that five equals five. You can do that here. There you go. Now, if you, if you do this, you'll get an error. So you can do asserts here also if you want to. Now, multiple dispatch is you have custom behavior defined on one or more types of arguments in a function. So let's do like function one. I'm not good with, with I'm, I'm not creative today. So function one that takes an X that is uh, an int 64 and takes a Y, second push argument that is a float 64. So this is going to return uh, int 
64 plus float 64. And we can do the function one that takes a y, an x that is a, a float 64, and a y that is an int 64. So this is the other way around. So here you, you have a multiple dispatch. Now, if I call function one with five and 5.5, .5, I get one behavior. If I call function one with 5.5 .5 and five, I get another behavior. So uh, that's very powerful in Julia. Uh, suppose you are training a machine learning algorithm and and you want to have a custom training loop. So you can you can call you can have the train function being called recursively, and depending on the training state, it does one thing, or it does the other thing, or it does another thing completely different. So you can create at runtime, depending on the arguments that you call the function, custom behaviors, and this is very powerful in scientific computing. Uh, this applied with uh, custom types is very powerful. So, for example, let me let me showcase something for you. So, this is I'm improvised. So, let me add a package called CUDA. This uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, CUDA race. I don't know if you have CUDA here, but but it will work. Don't add. Uh, don't worry. And. I have a package, so I'm I I I have a package of of linear algebra. So I have a nice nice linear algebra. .jl. This is my package, and in this package I have a function that takes the uh, m, which is any abstract matrix, and it does uh, I don't know m. It does the I don't know. Um, it does, uh, let's see, it does m times two, okay? It does element, element mu uh, multiplication of m, so return m, and there you go. So I'm this uh, package alter. I create a very nice linear algebra.jl package, and I have a function that, oh, it's a, uh, it's function name, it's a function, uh, let's do, matrix times two there you go that's that's the function that i have now i have no idea about the cuda package i have no idea that you can you can do stuff in the gpu i just created my package because i like to do stuff in, in julia so then a user comes by and say oh i'm gonna use the cuda package and then i'm going to define uh m the matrix it's a cool array one two three uh one two three four five six there you go oops uh okay let's change plans uh let's add Let's add something called static arrays, okay? Because we don't have CUDA here. So static arrays, there you go. We are going to use this. So there you go, statics arrays. So I'm gonna use this package now. So I, as the author, of the of the nice linear algebra package, I have a function that that operates on any type of matrix, and it it returns m multiplied by by two. The, this is matrix times two, and now I have a package called static arrays, which is a nice package in Julia that creates static matrix, and I'm gonna have a my m static matrix. This is an S matrix. Uh, oh, I always forget how to do that. Let me see. S matrix. Oh, boy. Let me see. S matrix. Oh, it's uh, actually static matrix. Does this work? Uh, 
I need to do a static matrix uh, int 64 and two, two and three. There you go. Oh, don't improvise live. There you go, static matrix. How do I do this? Okay, we have, actually we have a tuple and then we have a int 64, is that, is that it? Okay, it's actually like this, F matrix two, three. Now this should work, S matrix, yeah. Okay, now we have an S matrix here. And I, as a package author, I have no idea that static await exists and they have a special type called type of uh, M, Static matrix, this is uh, S matrix. I have no idea that this package exists. But this package, if I do super types of uh, this thing here. So this is an abstract matrix. So my uh, matrix times two will work. So if I do matrix times two, M is static matrix, it just works. It multiply everything by two. And that's because I, as the nicely linear algebra package maintainer, don't have to worry about uh, specific types. If the author of the static arrays defines how to do multiplication in his uh, type, my function will work. And this is very powerful because now you can combine stuff. For example, uh, if you are doing a Bayesian model and you want to put an ODE in your Bayesian model, you don't need to you don't need to have it everything set up. If there are some things set it up, those two things they can pretty much talk with, it, with uh, each other by the multiple dispatch and by having user defined, defined types. And this is very powerful in a data science or in a scientific computing ecosystem because algorithms, um, new types, new procedures, new techniques, they are created almost all of the time. If you take a look at the archives, submissions, and yeah, it's, it's much easier than if you do S4, R6 in R. So if you take a look at everything that's been created all of the time in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in the literature, in the scientific literature, uh, it's very complicated. So take something like PyTorch. For you to have something in PyTorch, everything needs to live inside of PyTorch. Now here, uh, the, the package author, nice algebra.jl, it doesn't know anything about S matrix. It's just doing matrix stuff in his package. So he's, as a package author, he can focus on nice linear algebra and the other package authors that they create different types of arrays, they will be, be preoccupied on creating all of the multiplication rules. And if uh, we without much effort from both sides, almost everything works straight out of the box, like I did here, for, for example. So this applied with multiple dispatch is, is, is what makes Julia very powerful for scientific computing and for creating new stuff and integrating a lot of scientific computing techniques, apart from the speed, of course. So this was an improvised example, but it shows it, it, it kind of showcase uh, the idea. So now let's move to anonymous function. So we have something Julia called anonymous function. In Python, you have something like lambda x and x 
uh, a square. So this is kind of the square anonymous function. In, in R, you'd have something like function x, x square, something like this. And in Julia, you have, since Julia is a very scientific, mathy language, you have the textbook notation. So x that maps to x is squared. So that's, that's how you do it. So this is your anonymous function. And you can do map this function into this value here. So now you, you, you get back 9. You can also do map this anonymous function to this collection here, 1 to 10. You get back a vector of squares. So that's how we specify anonymous functions uh, in Julia. You pretty much do map this, this here. And it, it, it can be anything. So you can also have like functions. So map log to 1 to 10 could also be a function here. Doesn't need to be anonymous. You are mapping this function to this collection. That's how map works. And the anonymous functions, what is nice is that um, we, can, we can take this anonymous function and put a, put a parenthesis on it and do something like this. And it works it's straight out of the bat. We can also say that uh, my anon function is this. And then you can do something like my anon function tree. And it works. Uh, also, if you do something like type of my anon function, you see that it's just a reference. It's a variable reference. So it's truly an anonymous function. It doesn't have a name. So that's how you do anonymous functions in Julia. And anonymous functions, they are very powerful because we can do the map and we can do also the reduce and map reduce operations. So Folks that like uh, per and function programming in R, they can do stuff like map, uh, like we did, uh, this function to this collection here, and it works. Uh, they can also do reduce as a binary operation. So if you don't know reduce, it's a way for you to do, to, to do a binary operation into a vector of in, into a, a list a collection. So this is going to do, uh, this is going to be one plus two plus three plus four, yada, yada, until 10. So this is what they reduced, they reduced us. Uh, so I have 55. I can also pass re anonymous function to reduce. So X here, I have to capture two, two elements because uh, the reduce expects a binary operation. So let's do x, y. And then I'm going to do uh, x plus y. And 1 to 10. I think this should work. There you go. It's the same thing. So here I'm capturing two elements. And I'm doing x plus y. So the, the only condition is it has to be a binary operation. So this means that takes two elements and returns one element. So then you can do anything inside the reduce thing here. You can also have very powerful uh, map reduce. So you can do something like, so map reduce, I'm going to map the function log. And then I'm going to apply the plus operator to all elements from 1 to 10. So this is going to first map the function log to the collection 1 to 10. And then it's going to apply a reduction on the binary operation plus. For that, the result from the mapping of the log to this uh, collection here. So then I have 15. So this is quite, I can also do this using anonymous functions. So I can do map reduce. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this uh, multi line so you can take a look. So first is the function that I want to map. So I can do x log x. So this is an anonymous function. Then I, 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 I do the binary function, the binary operation to reduce x, y. I need to capture two elements, maps to x plus y, and then the collection, 1 plus 10. And there you go. It's five 
14 is the same value here. So you see that functional programming is very, very powerful in Julia and, and, and very, very easy to do and very nice to do. So, and there is a, a theory in functional programming. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've heard from a very, very intelligent people. And since I'm a Bayesian, I have strong priors about the veracity of this assertion, but this, it, it is sad that um, it is said that all of the computer science algorithms, you, you can pretty much do them using MapReduce. So anything that in computer science you can you can do with a simple or a very complex map reduce, or maybe a, a recursive map reduce. So that's how we do function programming and how we specify functions in Julia. Any questions so far before we move into the last session, which is the structs? Okay, let's let's move then. Um, let's go to the final uh, topic of today: struct. So, struct in Julia, they are what we call uh, user-defined types, and there is a dash here, or custom uh, custom structures. And if anyone knows C, it's pretty much the same thing. But how we do struct in Julia is is we do struct. And then we say the name, the name of the struct. So this is, I don't know, uh, my struct. And then here, I can specify fields inside this struct. And of course, since this is a type, I'm going to use the title case. So title case, because it is a type. So here, let, let me say, let, let's do my point. Let's do something more concrete less generic. So my point, I have an X and I have an Y. So I have I have two fields. Now if I if I do this and if I do uh, field names of my my point you see that I have X and Y. And I think I can do field types of uh, my point. And as you can guess, if I haven't specified what type is the fields inside each struct, uh, they by default gets the um, it gets the any here, so it's an any type. Uh, now I'm gonna kill my repo because I I I will redefine my struct, so I'm gonna do Control D to kill my repo, and then I'm gonna open a new one without J and O. So now I'm going to say that this is a float 64 and this is a float 64. So let's define this. And now if I do field names and if I do field types, you see that all of those are float 64. And now I can instantiate points. So I can do point one is uh, my point. Now I pass in the first position argument. So I pass in something like X. So uh, let's say 1.0 and 1.0, there you go. So this is the my point. And now if I do point one X, I get back the X from inside my point. So inside my struct. Now, if I do Y, I get back Y. And I can also, uh, do something like function uh, Euclidean. No, let's do uh, function. Let's do let's do Euclidean distance. This. So this function takes a p one which is a my point and takes a P2, which is a my point. And 
it will pretty much calculate the distance. So it will, oh man, how, how do I, it's been a while since I haven't done that. So I pretty much add and take the square root. So I, if I'm, if I'm mistaken, please correct me. It's been a while since I haven't dabbled with, with, with geometry. Uh, so I'm going to do, so that's the square root uh, of the, let's do Manhattan distance. <laughs> it's easier. There you go. So this is the absolute of 0.1x minus uh, 0.2x. plus 0 0.2, 0.1y minus 0.2y. I think it's this, right? And I'm going to return this. Uh, then uh, let's try to instantiate another point. So let's do 0 0.2. So this is true and two, and let's see if this Manhattan distance works. B1 and oh, point one and point two. There you go. That's the distance between those points. Uh, and this works, uh, but there is one caveat. Uh, and before I answer the question, let me just, oh, let me answer the question right now. So how we will need to define the structure so that we can use keyword X and Y for the new instantiation. Uh, I think that I can do this, let me see. So let's do 0.3. So let's see, can I do X equals two and Y equals two? Uh, no. So the way I need to do is I will need to create a constructor here. I will need to do uh, my point uh x and y and this is a new x and y so this is the constructor so now um this thing here should work so if you do uh, x equals this and y equals this now it works so you need to create the constructor here that's how you do Uh, but there is one problem. If I go into my point one and I say, okay, point one, now your X is 10, I get an error. Immutable struct, my point cannot be changed. So the struct by default, they are immutable. And for you to change stuff, once the struct is instantiated, you need to create a mutable struct. So mutable struct, my mutable point, x and my, my uh, mutable point, and this has an x, which is a float 64, float 64, and this also has a y that is a float 64. There you go. Now, if I instantiate my, my mutable point, if I instantiate this and I do 0.1 x equals 10, this now works. So there is this difference between uh, mutable and immutable struct. By default, structs, they are immutable. But if you need to change it for your use case, your custom struct, your custom type, you need to update or change stuff, then you are looking for a mutable struct. Then you can you, you can change the fields. These are these are what what I call things that go inside this structure. Uh, then you 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 need a multiple struct. Then you can change this. Of course, you get a a small performance penalty because everything that is immutable is faster than everything that is mutable in computer science. But that's kind of it. Uh, and I think that's it for today. We have ten minutes, and if there 
uh, then we can we 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 can go into other questions. So that's it for the introduction to Julia, and I hope you enjoyed our brief overview of this amazing language and how you can you 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 can st uh, start straight away using Julia. Uh, I haven't covered any packages. Julia has a rich ecosystem of packages. I highly encourage you to to go over and take a look at all of the packages. Uh, take a look at the community at Julia Lang. So if you go to julialang.org and you go into uh, community here, you have nice stuff to do. So I highly recommend the, the discourse. So I highly uh, recommend the discourse forums. So go here if you have any questions about Julia. It's a very welcoming and engaging and warm community. So you will feel, you will feel welcome. Uh, the R community is also very nice. Julia community also strives to be a very nice community. And if you take a look at also the learn, you have several stuff for you to do, like Julia tutorials. You have a lot of books here. So feel free to learn Julia and, and data science. And finally, a small shameless plug. If you go to julia.datascience.io, we have uh, open, open access, open source. A uh, free to use book on how to do data science using Julia. This covers uh, data frames, data visualization. Uh, we are, I'm going to be working on a second edition in, the, in my, win, in my uh, summer break, which is your winter break because I'm in the South Hemisphere. So in December, January, we are going to be launching a second edition with more stuff. But the book is available here, free to use. We have translations from volunteers to Portuguese, to Portuguese and to Chinese. So feel free to use those. Uh, the book is free to use. Also, you can download as a PDF. And that's it. I'm going to stop the recording and we can go over into other dis uh, discussions until uh, 1 p.m. Eastern when we end the uh, workshop.